Okay, everyone, we're gonna go ahead and get started. We have a speaker who's late, so we're gonna move things around a little bit. Um, I am Michelle, uh, actually, did I say good morning? Good afternoon, good afternoon, everybody. I am Michelle Barkley. I'm the um, Vision Director of Communications, Children, Family, and the Courts um, in the Administrative Office of the Courts of Georgia. And this is our third class. Uh, this one is called Show Me the Money. It's part of our sixth class series titled Minding the Justice Gap. And I want to thanks, say thanks again to um, professors Lauren Sudell and Darcy Meals, who are in charge of the GSU School of Law A2J Center for hosting the series for us. We really appreciate their support and what they're doing for us. Today, we're going to have three people. We're going to have three separate conversations about getting money or fundraising to improve access to justice. I am going to talk to Professor Peter Bluestone, who works for Georgia State University, and we're going to postpone that conversation for a little while. My colleague is going to talk to Judge Bill Adams about fundraising for legal services, and my colleague Tabitha Ponder is going to talk to Georgia attorney Mike Monahan, who's on the call, who directs Georgia's pro bono program about states that do a better job than Georgia in accessing funds for access to justice issues and how that works and how it came about. Um, I'm going to ask Noelle to take the lead on this and start with Judge Bill Adams. Great. Thanks, Michelle. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Noelle Aguirre Alvarez. I work at the Judicial Council Administrative Office of the Courts alongside Michelle Barkley as her Assistant Division Director for Communications, Children, Families, and the Courts. Today, I have the great privilege of interviewing retired Judge Bill Adams, formerly of the State Court of Bibb County and a native son of Megan. Judge Bill Adams is the founder of Middle Georgia Justice, which he established upon his retirement in 2017 after 19 years on the state court bench. Middle Georgia Justice is a labor of love for Judge Bill Adams. He created it because he saw the need in his own community, specifically after seeing firsthand the lack of help for people who could not afford a lawyer. While Middle Georgia Justice provides some self-help resources, it primarily provides lawyers for the poor, and those lawyers need to be compensated for their work. And so Middle Georgia Justice has done incredible work fundraising to provide those legal services. Judge Adams, would you please tell us about your initial foray into fundraising when you first started Middle Georgia Justice? I'd be glad to do so, and thank you for inviting me to be a part of this webinar. Uh, we got started about five years ago after I left the courthouse, and it's evolved somewhat into a, a setup where we do provide uh, lawyers, either staff attorneys or volunteer attorneys, and then a self-help center, but all that takes money. And so the first thing we did was buy some uh, software, Network for Good. We recommended by that by Georgia Legal Services who we've collaborated with. And they uh, got us uh, with that product, which does several things. One, you can track your donations and then you can get your database of contacts and, and reach out to folks quickly as you go along. So you need that infrastructure, if you will, in place. And, and then part of what they offered was some teaching on how to raise money. I had five elections as a judge without opposition. So I was thankful not to have had to go out and ask people for money in that capacity, but now I do, and we do. And and the first thing they'll tell you is all about, you know, relationships and your contacts. Uh, and so we have a really strong board of directors uh, that uh, all lawyers to start off, we've uh, got some non-lawyers on there now, but your board is so important to fundraising as you go out in the community. 
you want people to know who your board members are and that they're known and respected. And, and so number one rule, you go out and you have to ask for money. It doesn't just come. It's, uh, you got to ask. And, and uh, once you get over that and, and learn that the uh, number two rule is that uh, you may, you have to deal with rejection. Some folks will turn you down and that's okay. Maybe later they'll come around. So we just went out and asked. And the first thing we did was get the, the state bar of Georgia provided us mailing labels. We paid for them, but it's something they approved what we were going to do. And we sent a letter to 836 lawyers in middle Georgia and told them, here we are, this is what we're gonna be doing. And would you please support us? We needed volunteers, of course, but we asked for donations. And that got us started with getting out into the community and asking for money for what we were doing. And it was pretty much an idea at the time, but the, uh, we have uh, now can show them what we're actually doing. And then we did a couple of luncheons, invited lawyers who we believe the uh, one uh, were very successful and two uh, would uh, get it about the need to improve mm -hmm. access to justice in our community. And that produced some good results donations wise. And, and then the state bar and the judicial council were supported early on and, and foundations that we started reaching out to foundations, some local, some uh, national and getting some good responses there. So you just jump in and you ask and you hope you get some positive responses and, and you build that database. And I mentioned the network for good. So as you go along, you're more easily able to communicate with your prior donors and reaching out to prospective donors. Excellent, thank you. So I've had the pleasure of attending your signature fundraising event that you call A Taste for Justice, two years in a row now. Would you please tell us how you got that event off the ground? First, let me thank you for coming last year and this year and Michelle and Judge Ponder were there last year and some others that came from Atlanta. Uh, to, to our event, and, and it was a sort of a natural evolution of what I described earlier as we were trying to get better known to elevate our profile as you seek to raise the money you need to do what you're trying to do. So the idea of an event came up, and the, what are the ingredients for a good event? You got to have a good venue, a good place to do it, you know, good food and drink and uh, music. Uh, just have a an occasion to gather socially that folks would want to be there and then use that event to go out and, and raise uh, primarily, primarily you're raising money through sponsors for the event. You set up your different levels and all this was, we did from scratch and, and come up with levels of sponsorship and what each level will get. And, and you start doing that you know, in advance of your event, of course, because that's really the main fundraising. We did a raffle, we've done a raffle each time, and that's helped raise some more money and, and, and make it a little more exciting for folks who want to come and see if they win uh, the raffle items. We've had some pretty good raffle items we've done, and, but mainly it's going out and seeking your sponsors. And we did our first one in 2019 and had a really good result uh, at a smaller venue here in Macon, the Society Garden. But it was well attended. Everybody there had a good time. And so this is something to build on. And the next year, of course, COVID kind of knocked out in-person gatherings. Uh, it, not kind of, it did. We were unable to do an in-person event. So we did a, a, a virtual event uh, and had sponsors and had some success still getting folks that like what we were doing to be a sponsor for that virtual event. But then the last two years, we've been down at Luther Williams Field. It's the old ballpark here in Macon. It's one of the oldest ballparks in America. It's historic. It's iconic. And the new owners have really done some great things. They had pavilions. And, and so we had the food and drink and live music and activities out on the ball field for the kids that were there. And, and everybody seemed to have a good time. And, and that's important. And so We've uh, built on what we started and, and had the best year ever this time with our sponsors, More, almost doubled our sponsors, and uh, including more of the platinum sponsors, the bigger, the higher level. And the event uh, was used as an occasion for 
uh, Wells Fargo to make a presentation to us there of a, one of those big checks, you know, and had uh, for one hundred thousand dollars, and the mayor was there, and uh, and, and the picture, and so uh, we uh, have reached out. What you learned, you have to do, is, of course, reach out beyond your legal community. That's a logical starting point, but you've got to go out into the entire community, and I can elaborate on that. And, and we've hired a development director, if I may add. I, I think that's a sign of a nonprofit's arrival when you can hire your own development director. And Lisa Berrien started with us in October, and she is wonderful and is doing some great things for us to help us step this up. Absolutely. It was a great night, Judge, and it was a, a, just a wonderful cross-section of the Macon community. So a pleasure to be there. Thanks. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, you're welcome. In a very cool venue. <laughs> <laughs> so in terms of, as you were mentioning, in terms of fundraising in 2022, it has been your most successful year ever. At the A Taste for Justice event, you and your team, as you just mentioned, received a check from Wells Fargo in the amount of $100,000. That was wonderful to see. Um, when you're when you're speaking with non-legal circles, what message do you give to non-legal entities such as one, uh, Wells Fargo? to inspire them to invest in providing legal services for the poor? Our message has evolved as we do, doing what we're doing and seeing the results and telling our story. And, and that story is that every, this is it, everyone in the community benefits, not just the folks that are our patrons or clients that get the direct result of the assistance we can provide, Everybody in the community benefits and in the context of banks, and we've reached out to other banks and had some good success. They will say, I'm not going to do a hundred thousand, but I will support you in a substantial way. And, and the bank's interest is uh, in blight reduction. You say, how does that connect? Well, we have a lot of houses that people live in that are titled to deceased relatives. It's called heirs property. And and a lot of folks in town don't really know what that is, but as you explain it and they get it, and the banks in particular have an incentive to support our efforts to clean up titles to property because they're obligated by federal law to make loans in distressed areas. And you go off on a tangent talking about that, but the point is, how do you make a loan on a house that doesn't have a good title? They can't give you a security deed. So the banks... That's the way you try to present it. it you benefit, you know, it's not just uh, some hypothetical, theoretical benefit to the community to promote equal justice under law, right? That's what we aspire to in America. We fall short, uh, but uh, th these are ways to bring us closer to equal justice under law that folks that cannot afford to get the assistance they need can get that assistance to clean up the title to their property. So the family home, as they'll call it, now is in their name. And, and stabilizing families, you know, in the divorce, custody, legitimation world, we do a lot of that. And, and, and you can stabilize families and criminal history relief where you help people uh, under Georgia law get things off their criminal record that improve their chances for employment and better housing. So as people get better jobs, you know, have places to live, that's a quality of life issue. It's a reduction in poverty issue. So the pitch is, and I've been making it a lot lately because our new development directors had me out on the road here and down calling on banks and hospitals and local businesses, some of whom seem not necessarily logical right off the bat as to an access to justice pitch. But the response has been really wonderful because they get it and see the need uh, is there that we can help meet that need and they can help us by making a, a donation, being financial supporters. And so you just, you got to reach out, you got to be proactive, tell your story. That, that's the, I mean, they just pound away, tell your story and we've got them. And, and when you share them, it's real life people with real problems getting real solutions. And, so you just persist and uh, build success can help breed success. And, and, uh, the, but the need is there. Everybody agrees. The need is there. I don't hear anybody saying we don't need to do that. No, the need is there. 
and it's substantial and, and Georgia Legal Services is in our community and throughout the state and I, they're wonderful. They do so much, but they can only do so much. And so there's a gap there and that's what we're trying to do is complement existing services and, and close the gap, the justice gap. Exactly. So what I hear you saying, Judge, is the crux of the skill is being able to, to translate how the work that you're doing is benefiting everyone in your community in some manner. And it's, yes, and it's a, a very tangible thing when you reduce it to cleaning, clearing a title to a house or, or getting something off someone's criminal record. Right. I mean, the employers in town, uh, some of them are struggling to find people to fill positions. And I helped a lady recently get something off her. That she had a criminal record, but they wouldn't let her work in the elder care. And we appealed it, had a hearing in Atlanta before an ALJ who reversed that ruling. And now she can work in the elder care. And the employer is delighted to have her because she was a good employee. Uh, and so the, those kinds of obstacles are out there. And they're I say it's a very tangible thing, clear obstacle to help people improve their lives. And in, in doing that, the entire community benefits. <clears throat> Absolutely. Well, as we wrap up here, I have to say, you can be doing a great many things, golfing, bird watching, what have you. So <laughs> I want to say, but you choose to do this work and it's, it's very special, Judge. So thank you for that. And I just want to give you the opportunity to share anything else you'd like to share with our audience for the record today? Well, the idea of pitching this to government, the, the state level, Michelle's working on that. And, I, and uh, we had the, our local government, I've been working on our mayor, uh, who is a lawyer and he gets it. And uh, last month, the county commission, uh, county commission voted to make a, an award to us, an appropriation from American Rescue Plan money in the amount of $250,000. And, and my pitch to them and the commissioners is, this is good constituent services. And whether it be done through state funding or your local government, that pitch that you make applies just as much to them. And so we need to be thinking of creative ways, perhaps in some cases, to reach out and educate people, inform them what we're doing with this access to justice uh, initiative and, and get the buy-in and the financial support because we'll all be better off if it happens. Absolutely. Well, with that, thank you so much for your time today and I'll turn it back over to Michelle. Thank you for having me. Yes, thank you so much, Judge Adams. We really Prisha and Noel for, for doing the interview. We are still missing our professor. I'm a little worried about him because he and I were talking earlier this morning, so I don't know what's going on with Professor Bluestone, but we will move on for now to um, Judge Tabitha Ponder, who's going to talk to Mike Monahan, and um, we'll just wait. And if this doesn't work out, if something has happened or so something has gotten confused about this, we will do a separate call and add it to this for our um, YouTube channel so that we have all of it together. So I'm going to ask Judge Ponder to take it away. Good evening or good afternoon, everyone. I'm Judge Tabitha Ponder. As I've stated before, I'm a part-time judge in Cobb County Magistrate Court. But today I am in the capacity of uh, staff uh, contract attorney for the Access to Justice Committee of the Judicial Council of Georgia. And I have the very good privilege to introduce my friend, um, Mike Monahan here, who I've worked closely with since I started um, with Access to Justice. And that's been actually since, uh, I guess, five now, five years now, Mike, uh, 2017, I came in at the end. And he's been a, a treasure <laughs> ever since. But Mike um, runs the lawyer pro bono program with the State Bar of Georgia. Mike, uh, could you just tell the audience a little bit about, you know, how you got to this place? <laughs> <laughs> Well, in brief, I, uh, good day. I'll say good day. I'll be the Australian. Good day, everyone. <laughs> um, we'll go right down the middle. Um, I, I'm actually here best, I think, if I bought as the staff liaison for the State Bar's Access to Justice Committee. When I joined, um, when I came on board with the Pro Bono Resource Center in 1997, it's been a while, um, I got recruited into a different kind of world. Um, back in the 90s, 
the, uh, there was a national sort of burgeoning effort around building justice communities. Um, and then the Legal Services Corporation, which is the big funder of um, legal aid across the country, the biggest, um, also urged uh, legal services programs to get involved in that sort of burgeoning effort on building justice communities. And we all kind of settled back then on the phrase access to justice, which is not really all that clear for a lot of lawyers and the public and, and our legislators. Um, and justice, I mean, Judge Adams, I think it's a good segue because um, you know, a lot of this is about storytelling and being able to tell a story based on what, essentially based on data, but giving it a face, giving data a real face. And that's, that's the hard part. So that's what justice community building started at. It started in five states. I'm gonna talk about two states later. Michelle, I mean, Tabitha, Judge Ponder and I are gonna get around to two states here, uh, Washington state and Florida. Washington state was one of the original five involved in justice community building. And, you know, um, and that dates back to prior to me with 92, 93, 94. Um, and then Florida came on board much later, much, much later. But um, what they did have in the early, in the 90s and the early 2000s in Florida was when I was around, a really charismatic bar foundation director um, who took this message and worked the crowd in the IOLTA community across the country at their regular meetings and on their agendas and things. So I got involved with those five states, which were back then were Washington state, the biggie. They were the, sort of the leader in all of this and actually got the dialogue started. And um, California State Bar, um, uh, Texas State Bar, Minnesota State Bar, um, and uh, da, 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 what am I missing here? I'm probably missing something. Uh, anyway, a lot of these positions, these main five were at state bars. And so when I came in 97 at the State Bar of Georgia, I was one of the six or seven people across the country who had a state bar position. State bars didn't have a lot of these positions. And so we were trying to morph these pro bono positions into something, a higher level with, that included pro bono, certainly, but would talk about incorporate the messages of justice community building and getting people to talk together, to talk and network, collaborate. Um, and so that's how I got drafted into it way back then. And I've been sort of working on the issues for a number of years now. Unfortunately, you know, we've got a very collegial community in Georgia. Um, most of that community is here in Atlanta. Um, because you know, as you move outside Atlanta, we of course have supporters and colleagues and collaborators outside of Atlanta, but the real heart of the real engine of the justice community building is actually here in Atlanta um, because you know the resources, et cetera. Now, uh, Michelle Barkley said earlier in her introduction that we weren't so good at fundraising in Georgia. And I, I, she shouldn't have included you know, the Judicial Council in that because I think in Georgia, George has been a great and a very good model about uh, leg state legislative funding and about that storytelling and gathering data that's behind that. So you really, I, I think you need to give yourself a lot of credit for that. Beyond that in Georgia though, however, it's been in my experience in my early days and since my early days, program by program by program by program and not really a great deal of um, collaboration and networking and building a network in a justice community about fundraising. Um, but fortunately, you know, we've, you know, avoided uh, what's happened in a number of other states, which are, you know, outright confrontations. And people, like I said, we were in a collegial community. Um, but the access to justice movement way back when I started was really about three things. Promoting accessibility, not just access to the system, but the way, um, accessibility in the way you get to the services including dealing with marginalized populations, language issues, you know, um, isolated populations, and not just about poor people generally. Um, and, and that's important. It's also access to justice is about ensuring fairness within the overall system um, so that um, like programs are situated like, uh, like others. Um, and that, um, you know, we are accountable to the public and to the clients who this is all about to begin with. And the third is increasing efficiency. The access to justice movement when I started should still be the same today, which is, you know, our job is to avoid duplication of effort. It's, a, it's to increase efficiencies, sharing platforms when we can. And, you know, controversially, my subject today will be really about um, difficult discussions um, around um, reforming how we go about fundraising in Georgia. 
how we deal with that, those issues. Right. You know, um, the best kind of change comes from difficult conversations. Yes, I do agree with that. And if it was easy, it would have been done. That's what Justice Benham always says. So we have to keep going here. So Mike, you've been in this field for a very long time, right? You've um, you've told us about a few states uh, that have been doing, you know, great job in accessing funds and getting funding, uh, sufficient funding to improve access to justice. So a, the example that you you had given us before, you talked about Florida. And Washington State. So let's uh, let's start with the Washington State. Let's talk about them. Um, sure. What? Why is that? Why? Why do you think that model works? Well, I, I picked Washington State because since the '90s, even, like as the leader in this sort of movement across the country, Washington State has been very systematic, um, year after year after year, in how it builds. And I, I, the best thing about Washington State, I think, for today's discussion is that the one thing they started with was communication, a communications plan, and they, which they've evolved over the years. But their success was rooted in communication, communication about legal needs, communication about uh, communication within programs, communication uh, among the programs, communication among the courts and the programs, so that everyone, so that the process of change was transparent from the beginning and continued in that fashion to build trust so that people could make difficult decisions. And talking about funding is always a difficult conversation because it's always about whose ox is going to get gored in funding decisions, or it can be about you know, increasing the pie for everybody. But the, the, those discussions I've seen over the years have always devolved into more in the middle, which is a little bit of whose ox is going to get gored and the hopefulness surrounding increasing the pie. And at, Individual legal services organizations, or LSOs, as you know, we'll, we'll call them, has really been about, um, you know, each program owning its own fundraising um, and rarely participating in, in collaborative fundraising. Um, and there are reasons for that. And, and, you know, a lot of that's historic and a lot of it's built on relationships. But, you know, let me just give you an example on the pro bono side. All the programs in Georgia, the legal services programs in Georgia, that we typically deal with, um, or I'm knowledge of from the state bar level, we use only about 10 to 12 percent of available lawyers annually in pro bono efforts. That leaves 90 percent of what 44,000 lawyers sitting out there that we don't touch, that we don't communicate with, that we don't actually place a case with. And so um, we we still have some sentiment in the community about where you're recruiting lawyers who you're recruiting them with and what your message is to those lawyers. And people are, and, and programs can be territorial still, not, not in a conflict difficult way, but there's a concern there and, it, and it's, it's palpable. So you can imagine what the discussion is and that palpable feeling around discussions about shared funding efforts. And I think the Judicial Council's efforts present a really good model uh, about how programs can provide feedback to an entity uh, like the Judicial Council, which can then move on and do the work and reach down and grab the stories and present the stories and then get the data. And that's an important piece of the puzzle for fundraising too, because as we saw in Washington State and their issues in, around communication and collaboration, having getting programs to trust them, uh, that access to justice effort strong enough to hand over data, um, to share, and to share in the community. Um, programs there in other parts of the country and here are also you know, a little hesitant about sharing data, all data, because they feel it might be a bad reflection on them. It might be, you know, it might go against some storytelling that they're trying to focus on. Um, so those are important issues. So Washington State is important for communication. And we need it. And now the with regards to the pyramid idea, was that part of Washington State's model? Yes, the Dot West, they were really great about the pyramid model. Um, and, you know, you can also think of it as a vending machine. Um, <laughs> but the pyramid model, uh, and I think you've, you've discussed this maybe in a prior podcast or webinar, but the, the pyramid model essentially is if you look at a pyramid, the bottom 40% or so, maybe 45%, is comprised of people with needing people in Georgia, 
whether whatever their income is, looking for information, asking the question, do I even have a legal problem? And if I do, what is it? And then what's the next step? Um, so, and the next piece up is, you know, where you get a lawyer involved to design the thing, to deliver some sort of um, twist or advice on that 40% of materials that were developed down below. The next third level up is where you actually need a lawyer to come in for maybe to, to, to do a motion for someone, to help them fill out a form and say, yes, this form is good, you can go file this, that kind of thing. But the very top of the pyramid is very small. And that's really where, um, strangely enough, you need full on lawyering. You know, you need a legal aid lawyer um, to come in and or an immigration lawyer to come in, a volunteer lawyer to come in, and represent that person in a court or an administrative proceeding. Now, in terms of the communication piece of, in, of Washington state, where that comes in is, you know, if you've got these four levels and each one represents a different kind of activity or a different set of activities, what funding goes into each of those levels of that pyramid? Where does that funding come from? Who should be doing that work? And who should not be doing that bottom pyramid work? It should be doing more of the upper level pyramid work. So, you know, how you design your access to justice system is really about, you know, building the choices in where programs come in, can come in and participate in that pyramid um, and having a very, um, um, you know, a very um, hard process of determining the priorities of who's in that process and who's not in these different processes. Then it also speaks into who gets invited in uh, to do these things and discussions around what these programs are best suited for, which we don't necessarily, which we've not done in Georgia generally. There have been tiny instances over the years where, you know, we try to get a program to come in and take, uh, take over the void created by the loss of another program. An example would be the Georgia Law Center for the Homeless. Who's taken over that work since that program's demise? And it, it's not readily apparent. Um, and they deal with um, homeless, the population in, Georgia, in Atlanta mainly. So, you know, there's, you know, funding priorities are a matter of discussion for that pyramid. Really important. I think that's a really important visual because it speaks to a lot of things, many things. It, it really does. And, and, I, and I, I know, you know, you know, firsthand as well as I do, just seeing how important, like the bottom of that pyramid, it, you can provide folks with a lot of legal resources and you don't necessarily need a lawyer, but, and then similar to like Georgia Free Legal Answers, um, where I've assisted with your, your program and vol just, I just go on and answer a few questions. Yeah, you have lawyers um, volunteering, but we are really answering one or two questions and that person is fine and they're able to move forward in the legal process, um, the judicial system. So that pyramid is so important. I hope we, we can push that visual out a lot more so that people can actually see it. Um, well, you know, there's always, a, there's always been a discussion about, you know, access to justice for everyone. How do you achieve that? But, you know, the, Richard Zorsa, um, uh, who's since passed on, was a real genius in this area for many years and did technology, access to justice, and was a well-regarded speaker. But he did believe in 100% access to justice, that you could achieve it. But what it meant is everyone who comes into the system gets the thing that they need. They, it, and that may not be a lawyer. Not everyone needs a lawyer. Um, it means you get, the, you get the service that meets your need. And that's 100% access. Um, Absolutely. So I have one more question. Let's talk about Florida. Yeah. Um, what, let's talk about what the state has done well in regards to access to justice and funding. Well, I, I want to preface, preface it by saying, first of all, every state's different. Uh, right. Our Bar Foundation is a lot, um, in terms of its basic mission, is a lot like the Florida Bar Foundation. Our IOLTA dollars are much, much lower compared to Florida. Florida, uh, IOLTA, it's interest on lawyer trust accounts in case you're not in IOLTA is the acronym for interest on lawyer trust accounts, which means that when lawyers engaging in business for on behalf of a client, money is received from the client or through transactions um, go into a special trust account and interest is earned on that trust account. Now we all say there's not a lot of interest out there nowadays, and that's probably true. But if you when you pull it all together, all of the activity together and all of the interest together, it amounts to a heck of a lot of money. In Georgia, um, the Bar Foundation in 2021 released about 7.4 million, 7.3 million dollars in Bar Foundation money for legal services or law-related um, uh, uh, activities. In Florida, it was about 75 million. Now, Florida has a lot of real estate transactions and constantly generating interest on, on trust account money, which is why they have so much. So it's not a matter of 
for the general public to understand here. It's not a matter of their far bar foundations better than our bar foundation, because that's not true. Um, and uh, the Georgia Bar Foundation has a history, a long history of dedicating its revenue from the interest on lawyer trust accounts to, to direct legal services organizations. And that's that's laudable. It's um, it doesn't have to be that way. In fact, I think about 84 percent, if I remember the, 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 the most recent um, stats, about 84 percent of the Bar Foundation revenue this past year went to direct legal services delivery and about 16 percent went to more law related or social services support for agencies that deal with lawyers um, in some respect or the courts in some respect. Um, so that's on behalf of the legal services organizations. I say thank you. Uh, <laughs> but in Florida. Florida has a, Florida's history is, again, as I mentioned, they had a very charismatic director back in the 90s and 2000s um, who really understood access to justice and what this movement was about back in those days. And she wasn't alone. There were several. I'm, I'm not going to single out, uh, I'm not singling out just Florida, but that's our, that's for today I am. Um, and her name was Jane Curran. Uh, funny story about getting struck by lightning in a car. Um, hilarious, hilarious person, very charismatic. But she's retired now. But what she did was lay the groundwork and what the Florida Bar Foundation has been has managed to do. And this is a model that I think, you know, is interesting. Um, and again, it's my opinion and not the opinion of the Access to Justice Committee or the particular program I may work with, Georgia Legal Services Program or any other program. But what they've done in Florida is they've used the the, I, the, the Georgia Bar, the Florida Bar Foundation, which been, handles the interest on lawyer trust accounts to be an engine for access to justice. Um, now, it's part, it's part of an, the overall engine because the courts, are in, the, court, the courts are integrated into this effort, the legal services organizations and the Bar Foundation. So they're all working together. And it, it's, I think they've created their efforts. They, they solidified their efforts in, in 2014. Some of the activity was going on for several years before 2014 because they were baking it. And then, you know, the timer went off in 2014 this year and they signed the documents. So there's a lot of work that goes into this kind of building process before people sign on. Um, and Florida did that work with Jane. So in 2014, what they did was actually declare through Supreme Court rules, you know, what, where this money is going to go and how it's going to be spent, that sort of thing. And it's evolved over the past eight years or so um, to where they're getting more specific about the kinds of legal services programs and the kind of work that should be done. Um, you know, there's <laughs> evolution always occurs and people are seeing issues within it. Obviously, that's the nature of the beast in any organization and any, anyone's life. It's evolution. So um, that has really engendered a lot of like movement in the community. So, for example, when it came to um, all of legal aid programs in the country have different choices of the case management system. And what does that mean? Oh, that's kind of boring. It's case management. But what it does mean is it implicates uh, the capacity to make ref uh, digital referrals or do centralized intake for your program or to share in centralized intake, to share pro bono, available pro bono cases. Um, so that technology, the Bar Foundation used a little bit of its, a little bit of an elbow there and, uh, and its purse strings and its check writing capacity to urge programs who, to adopt a uh, very similar platform or the same platform in terms of a case management system. And they could each evolve it differently, but there were certain guidelines that about referral capacity, about intake capacity, so that, you know, each of the programs didn't like spend inordinate, inordinate amounts of their own resources and trying to figure out the technology and implement the technology and change it. They had more of a statewide, state-driven, shared resources, shared training, a lot more, there was a lot more much more administrative support going into it for all the programs and they benefited from that. Did they like it, all the programs? No, they didn't all like it. Uh, but what they got out of it was, again, um, increased efficiency, uh, reduced duplication in effort and resources. Um, so they get that. It also resulted in a, a, pro, in a uh, online application called uh, Florida um, Legal Matters .org. Oh my God. Um, it's, it's escaping me. It's not Florida legal. Let me get my notes here. Hang on a second. I want to say what I'm doing here. Florida, come on. Florida pro bono matters.org. I should note that I'm the pro bono guy. Florida pro bono matters.org and spell out Florida. 
but it gave him one common platform across the state for any legal services organization that wanted to participate to upload their available cases. So volunteers anywhere in the state could volunteer anywhere else in the state. So if you have an immigration case, your program does immigration work, you post it. And if you don't have a lawyer up in, I don't know, St. George's who does immigration or Tallahassee, you've got some lawyer in Miami who can do an immigration case for you. Um, yeah. So it opened up a whole new world of collaboration. So that was a real, really good way of leveraging the authority of the person who holds the purse strings. Got it. Well, that's um, some good stuff we, we can learn from Florida as well as Washington. And Mike, I'm sure we're going to probably have to lean on you some more as we move forward with uh, making our funding requests. Um, but, but really grateful that we get to work closely with, with the State Bar's Access to Justice Committee. So thank you for everything you're doing. Oh, Michelle. Thank you. Yes, thank you both. I really appreciate it. And um, just so you know, we posted the um, pyramid image and the paper on the resources um, page for you all. So P Professor Blusa must have had something come up. Um, we have been corresponding quite a bit about this contract that we have with him because he is doing a return on investment analysis uh, for us, access to, I'm sorry, um, yes, Access to Justice Committee within the J Judicial Council AOC. Um, to let us know what is the return on investment uh, for the self-help center, especially the one we're focused on in Albany. And I know that he is going to be able to join us. I'm, uh, I'm hoping he'll be able to join us later. And what we'll do is we'll put these th two things together on our YouTube channel. And I'm going to ask Darcy if she'll send out our notice when we've done that. Um, and I apologize, but also you're going to get out early, which is also a good thing. And we'll circle back to you later. And thank you all for joining us. And have a wonderful day. Bye, everybody.